oh, we're suddenly building trust and respect. Suddenly this thing, which is having one-on-one meeting, is turning into this this practice, which is building trust and respect amongst humans. And that's a big deal, right? It's Michael. It's Joel. Oh, I'm so excited. Your audio, amazing. Your video. Have you done this before? I have done this before. (laughs) And is that like slack plaid pillows behind you? It's a blanket. It's a slack blanket. Oh, it's a blanket. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Why, thank you. It tests very well. Everyone notices it. So I just leave it there because everyone's like, well, that's cool. You're going to laugh at this. So I follow you on LinkedIn. Like I follow your content on LinkedIn. Right. For a while now, for probably about two, two or so years. Uh huh. And then I also uh, have been a member of the RANS uh, Slack and I have. Uh, one of your books that's on my bookshelf. Oh. Yeah, Managing Humans. But I didn't connect that Michael Lopp was Rans and Repose <laughs> until <laughs> 10 minutes ago. <laughs> um, it's all a big boy. It was a funny story. Um, I left Slack last, uh, late last year, and the gentleman who replaced me, who uh, I just met recently, um, was uh, he was having some issues with uh, meetings and he sent the a Rans and Repose meeting blog to my ex team, not knowing that I was the former VP of engineering there. And they all thought it was kind of a joke. They're like, ha ha, this is funny that you're sending this. We've been working for this guy for four years. And he's like, what do you mean? He's like, they're like, that's that was our boss. He's like, what? <laughs> so it's a common error that Rans and Michael Lopp are not necessarily tightly bound and by design, by the way. So, um, <laughs> so what does Rans mean? It's, um, it's my wife's maiden name. Um, about a million years ago, I was logging into a chat room or something and you needed back when we made up names for uh, online and I was like, Oh, I need a name here. What's something short. And I was dating this lovely woman whose last name is Rans, my wife now. And I was like, Rans. And I just, it was one of these things, the decisions you just threw away immediately, but it, uh, it, it turned out to be sort of the name that I'm associated with online. Oh, well, it sounds good. It's short, <laughs> it's simple, it's memorable. And now you have two identities. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, you're like, you're like a superhero now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not really, but yes, <laughs> there's multiple identities. It's useful though. Um, when people say Rans to me back when we actually like, hung out in like places together, I knew what they're talking about. They're talking about that guy on the internet. But if you call me Lop, it means we work together. So like physically working, I mean, actually work together. So it's kind of handy index to kind of know which person they think that I am. <laughs> so when did you start writing? I was, um, I've been writing since I was a kid. Um, I have journals, a garage full of journals. Um, but I really started writing online probably late nineties or so. Um, but back before there were blogs, I was, uh, just, I, uh, was just, I was really frustrated by leadership and sort of like things that I thought were, um, obvious that people weren't doing. So I'm like, I'm going to write this down. And I started sharing it and it turns out a lot of folks were sort of similarly concerned about these leadership things. And especially for engineers, like basic habits not being done well. And that's kind of, that kind of, it's kind of how it got started. I just, started saying obvious things, writing them down in sort of semi-coherent ways. And it kind of took off from there. So did you go right into doing a blog or did you just start writing notes or interesting things? It, it was a, it was mostly the blog. Yeah. I, 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 the blog was just sort of a personal thing for me. And then I, uh, I, I don't remember which the article was, it was something around one-on-ones or something. And the, I thought there was like seven people reading the blog or eight. Um, And suddenly 200,000 showed up that Wednesday. And I was like, Oh, there's a lot of people on the internet. So it was, um, it was that, that feedback of the content that was react uh, being um, received well kind of guided me. And I was like, I, every time I talked about leadership pieces or management or this sort of thing there, everyone would show up. So I'm like, okay, cool. This is a, there's a nerve here that I've struck. So let's, let's focus on this. Well, you're a fantastic storyteller. Like I, thank you. I thought I was going to be late to the interview because <laughs> I was just reading through some stuff. I was like, I, I connected that managing humans. I look over on my shelf. I'm like, I know that book. And there it is on my <laughs> shelf. And then I grab it. I was like, Oh, I wonder if there's any good content to like talk about in here. And I was like, Oh, 
he's too succinct and good of a writer. There's like 76 topics to cover. I was like, there's no way. And then I, I put down the book and I was like, oh, it's time. Let's go talk to him. <laughs> but where did, where did you pick up like this? The, the Obviously, so you start writing. I'm just trying to build this this map and yeah, yeah. add this timeline. So you start writing. You realize that you have a knack for and there's people reading. Right, at, right. At what point, if ever, did you say, okay, I'm a writer and so I'm going to start researching writing and become better at writing? Um, there's two questions there. There's choosing to invest in getting better at it and sort of like officially calling yourself a writer. I, to this day, after reading three books, I still don't always consider myself a writer. So, you know, imposter syndrome, blah, blah, blah. But I think if you publish a book, I think you probably can probably say you're a writer. I'm just going to go out on a limb there. But I mean, I was writing, I, again, I've been writing my entire life. So, but like that, that is officially like the book was there it's sort of this milestone in life and you're kind of holding it in your hand. And you're like, cool. I think the world thinks I'm a writer or someone does at least. So that's that. Um, but the second part of getting better at it, um, I, the, the, the inflection point there for me was when I started getting an editor for my pieces, someone on the internet was like, Hey, lop your, your rands, whatever your name is. Um, <laughs> um, uh, your stuff's good and you're just horrible at grammar and spelling. Um, it would be really, I would, I would happily edit these things for you. And that started a, a process of, uh, actually paid an editor for a long time to like edit my stuff. I'd send it to her and she'd edit it and send it back that just over the years, I got better and better at sort of like doing that myself. Um, and, uh, you know, using Grammarly, just going through that process and understanding that, the writing process is delightful and a ton of fun and inspirational. The editing process is not as much fun, but as important, if not more important to getting a piece to be world-class. Um, it's not the stuff you like to do because I, I write a piece and I'm like, cool, I brought this amazing thing into the universe and it's perfect. And no, never. That's the case. It needs a lot more work. And again, I think the editing, which again is harder work, is the difference between a good piece and an amazing piece. And that's, that's, that's the thing that I, I continue to work on is that editing process and how to take a piece, uh, a partially formed idea and make it a fully formed idea. Yeah. It's not easy. I set out and did a book about two and a half years ago. Yeah. I learned so much because there's all of that that you're talking about, like actually putting it together and then editing. I think I, went through like six revisions with the editor, just making sure like the grammar and everything was right. And that, you know, you have to step away, let your mind clear and then come back in. So hard. Yeah. It's just, it's a, it's an intensive process. And then you put it out there and uh, <laughs> I just did like the self publishing through, through the Am Amazon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's, it was such an experience to put writing out there yeah. And for me to say one thing and then for the world to read it and I'll do talks and I'll meet them in person and they'll say, you know, I, Oh, I, this was so helpful. I took this from your book. And I was like, that is not in the book at all. <laughs> and <laughs> it was so interesting how people apply yeah. their, their yeah, lives totally. and their experiences on top of your writing. Yeah, no, I, it, it's, I had this, uh, I was doing a, I used to go to South by Southwest and I was doing a talk there with some friends and um, I wrote this piece called the the Nerd Handbook, which was a um, which was a sort of a I don't I think it might be in the first book, um, but it was it was a handbook for keeper owners of nerds, if you will. So like these are certain habits that I have. And I was I started writing the pieces, just me kind of listing things, and then I'm like, oh no way, I'm going to invert this and make it how my wife views my habits in sort of a humorous way. Um, and it was just so much fun to write and therapeutic. Um, but at this, after the South by Southwest talk, this woman came up to me and she said, hey, that article I'd written five years earlier or something like that. She's like, that saved my marriage. And I'm like, ha, 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 that's right. She's like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> it saved my marriage. And I was like, oh, um, that's amazing. And that was not the intent of the piece, but it was, um, it was one of those things that you get your writing out there. People are going to are going to fill the spaces between your words with their own experience and they can learn fascinating things maybe that you don't even intending to do but it was it was it's very gratifying i love i love getting things out there and hearing about how people are reacting to it and what type of reactions are you getting from your new book the best compliment i received was on twitter a couple of days ago um i 
I, I, I struggle with a lot of the leadership work because it's very abstract. Like, how do you know you're actually, this is the problem new engineers have with leadership is like you move from this world of like write code, fix a bug, very abst uh, concrete things to sort of like make sure that humans are okay. It's like, what the hell does that mean? So it's always, it always feels a little disingenuous to me to be writing these things without saying like, this is your action plan, or these are the concrete things that you can do. Um, but it's just part of the gig of, of leadership is some of it is really abstract and subjective. Um, so the compliment for the most recent book was, this is the most actionable um, leadership book I've ever read. And I'm like, phew, because that was the design for the third book, Small Things Done Well, was, okay, don't worry about the big, huge leadership things. Go focus on the little tiny things and, and the value of doing those small, little, tiny things. And it's, it's, go read it. I, literally, the first or the second chapter is, here are the 30 things that you should do. And some of them are a little bit vague or a little bit sort of a subjective, but mo many of them are just really, really just straightforward, like do one-on-ones, like really, really all the time or show up on time. I mean, simple things that, you know, collectively can have a lot of effect on how you're perceived as a leader, as how you're, how you're viewed as a leader. Yeah. I was thinking about like athletes watching different documentaries and it's so amazing. They're at the height of their career, making unlimited money. Everyone knows their last name. And they're just drilling the fundamentals in different ways with coaches all, the time. all day. They just yeah, drill the fundamentals. Exactly. There's only so many things you can do. Yeah. And no, it, yeah. It's, I think it's exactly right. And that's the thing that I, that was the epiphany of the, of the book was, you know, I think a lot of people think that like leadership is like this, you know, genetic or you're predisposed and, and there's some, there's some truth to that. But the, I think at the end of the day, it's the set of small things that you do on a daily basis that creates trust, it creates communication, it makes you reliable, blah, 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 all those things that I think is, uh, is handy. So, and it's different for every person because every person is a beautiful chaotic snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's the full quote I want from this interview. <laughs> You're exactly right. And I think what, you know, when people say that, oh, they're, they're born leaders. I think what they do is they, they sort of like cherry pick yeah. one like aspect or vector. Maybe it will be communication. Obviously, I, I see a lot of people doing that when someone can speak well, they're like, oh, they're a natural leader. It's like, no, their communication skill level is, is high, but right. you don't know. There's so many more other uh, dynamics to being a leader. Yeah. 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 I totally agree. Totally agree what's the biggest takeaway or the thing that you wish like stuck with people the most from your latest book? Um, I think probably patience. The, 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 one of the, the intro of the book is pick a thing and then do it a thousand times. Um, which you're like, what? I want to read this book and get to be, be a better leader like tomorrow. And it just doesn't work like that, especially whether you're an athlete or a leader or any sort of complex skill, if you want to think about it like that. It takes a lot of work. And it's not just, it's not just a repetition of doing that thing over and over again. It's being open to learning why you're doing it. I'll give you an example. It's in the book is I, I, my number one thing is like do one-on-ones and great. Um, what does that mean? Why? Um, connect with the team. Okay. Um, learn from the team about how they're feeling about things. Ooh, that's interesting. Um, use it as a means to get early warning about things going sideways. Well, this is getting better. Uh, use it as a time to admit when you're screwing up something and admit failure. Oh, we're suddenly building trust and respect. Suddenly this thing, which is have a one-on-one -on -one meeting, is turning into this this practice, which is building trust and respect amongst humans. And that's a big deal, right? But it doesn't come from doing the one-on-one, -on -one, it comes from doing it a lot and learning from it and understanding why I'm choosing this practice and reflecting on it. And almost all of the things in the new book are like that, where it's like, yeah, I think I should just do that. Great, awesome. You're a, a third of the way there <laughs> or a 10th of the way there. After a hundred times, you'll be halfway there. And after a thousand times, you'll be pretty good about understanding why this is this practice is important and you can learn from it and why it's part of like, you know, your leadership sort of instinct or something. That's the thing. And it, but it's just, it's patience. It's knowing that it's going to take a long time to learn this complex skill. But that's difficult. And I want it now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, in, you're in very good company because that's most people on the planet earth. It's, it's, it's a very, it's a very, you know, uh, quick and dirty 
hack sort of like, you know, fast track, you know, seven effective habits of a leader sort of like world right now. And it's not, it's just, it's going to take a long time. That's okay. It's a, it's a tough, tough struggle. So like we got into the leadership business right after this podcast. And so, and I had never been in there before. And so how that's relevant is it brought up this concept of how you monetize it and how you sell it. And then how, and when you're doing that, you see your customers and how people think about it. Right. And it's a tough struggle, you know, personally for me, because, you know, I would say 80% of the customers, you know, want the quick fix and they just want it now. And now if I purchase this product, like it and do one or two things, like I'll be good. But then you, you're also justified by like the 20% that you know someone's going to come in here and they're going to implement it and have some success. And that's going to be like a little ember to a fire that will then right. start. So you kind of like, I guess I'll take it back to when I do public talks. I always go into it with the mindset of there's one person in the room that's going to find something useful and that's a yeah. win. Yeah. My version of that is when I do a talk is, um, there's only one slide in here out of the 50 that actually matters. And it varies depending on the person. <laughs> but there's only, if they get one thing out of this deck of 50 slides, I'm super happy. Although I've taken to, actually when I do talks now, I, I've taken to saying like, this is the only thing that matters in this 50 minute talk is this one slide here. If you do this, you've gotten all of them. <laughs> like, I actually declare it now because I just want people to be super clear about the point. <laughs> and, then, and back to patience too, because you know when I was a kid, my, uh, my dad had said, you know how parents will say something to you? They don't even remember saying it, but somehow it sticks with you for like ever. Sure. Yeah. So the thing my dad said to me, he doesn't remember because I've asked him as an adult, but he told me when I was young, he said, patience is a virtue. Like you're going to have to right. learn patience. Yeah. And that's just something that like has repeated throughout my entire life. And what I noticed is as I'm 32 now, but as I, as I have got older, specifically in my late twenties, I noticed that I could I could see the people who were executing consistently and had patience. I could see mm -hmm. them getting better results on a gradient or on a spectrum of those, you know, who did not. And so what happened is that changed my desires, like almost like the palate, like the taste in my mouth, it changed it to doing difficult things over long periods of time. Right. That will give me a better life. And so you can kind of fall in love with that. And that's something that I've been experiencing the past five years. That's really changed my life. Yeah. Agreed. It's hard to sometimes, especially when the sky is falling or everyone's yelling, like a, a practice of patience in that moment is precisely the right thing to do, but it feels a little tone deaf when everyone's like, Oh my God, the site's down or whatever the crisis is, but it's still exactly the right strategy. And actually what people respond to it well, and they're like, cool all right, well, Lop's not freaking out. So maybe we shouldn't freak out. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> that's, and that's true. Cause they, you as a leader, they look to you for how to react. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So how has the writing, you know, helped you as you've gotten to work on these great projects? You've, you've had an amazing history. You've gotten to work at awesome companies throughout your career. And I'd say like, I, I think I saw like five to six different cool companies that you've gotten to work mm -hmm. for. And so yeah. the transition point between those, did the writing have any impact on that? Um, I don't have to write a resume anymore, which is really nice. Um, that's, so that's, that's a plus. Um, the, the, the writing, here's the thing about writing that I say, um, writing makes you smarter. It makes me smarter um, because I, it, the, the act of, of, of finding an idea and going, oh, that's interesting, um, is interesting. But the act of passing it through my fingers and getting it written down and sitting and staring at it teaches me more about how I feel about the idea and gives me more vision and strategy around it. So it literally makes me smarter about that thing. And, you know, uh, it's, it, it, it's sort of... <laughs> Usually when I'm talking, I'm almost always quoting myself from something that I've written. And if, so if I sound at all smart to you, it's because I literally wrote it down and I said it, like literally what I'm saying right now is a thing that I've written as well. And it's because I've taken that time to really refine the idea and to edit it and to make it more coherent or clear, hopefully. Um, so that's the thing, the biggest value. So when someone asks me a question like you just asked me or a question about one-on-ones or about like, you, it, it's going to sound like I'm like just this, I'm just echoing this wisdom right straight out of my head. I'm not, 
I'm reading you the article that I wrote four years ago on the topic of feedback or this or that or blah, 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 whatever it is. So that's the thing I really, really like about it. And I think there's, there's leaders out there that just do that naturally. They're just like kind of ad libbing, kind of just YOLO amazing. And I wish I was that person. I'm not, um, I'm a writer. So I have to write it down first to truly see how I feel about it and how I'm organizing it or what the right way to tell the story is. So it's incredibly valuable. It's, it's given me just about every successful thing, including my marriage is a result of me writing (laughs) (laughs) really, really. (laughs) I like that because, you know, a couple months ago, or originally the podcast was all about like leadership from day one. I was just figuring right. out how people thought. And then after two years of that and hundreds of episodes, I was like, okay, I'm getting into this repetitive. So I wanted to start talking about, you know, newer things like the future and Elon Musk and Neuralink and just, you know, bring those up and then also mix in leadership. Mm-hmm. And what happened to me was I would have this idea or this thing I wanted to think about and I would just put the bullet point in there. And then when it came up in a conversation, I like realized I didn't have any substance, like some, uh, what's the word? Substantive thoughts. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's a hard word to say. I got the uh, (laughs) um, Invisalign in too now. So, uh, you know, to have good solid thoughts around something. And then what I realized is one day by accident, I had a thought and I was writing it down in my Evernote and I like, you know, sat there for 20 or 30 minutes articulating it. Yeah. And then the next time I had that conversation, I had a good thought to share. And so I said, all right, well, now this has to come into my habits. Yeah. It's, it's, it's at the point now when I was doing a meeting before this and, I, and someone said something, I'm like, ooh, that's a blog post right there. Like I heard, I, I heard the line, I'm like, ooh, that's a good line. And in my head, I'm like, ooh, this, but it's not really a blog post. Um, but I can see that there's an there's an article there. That's that's a delight when you have when you've worked on that muscle enough to be like, ooh, God, give me like three hours with this this sentence, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have 700 words. They're gonna be just amazing. Um, that's another thing that comes with practice as well. Is that piece is it's 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 a joy. <laughs> it's like if I'm on your team, I'm I'm almost like uh, nervous that it's like Katy Perry when she breaks up with a boyfriend, a song comes out. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> It's like you get fired from Michael and like a whole book comes out. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's, um, it's a tricky thing because I have, to, I have to obfuscate a lot of things when I write about like leadership stuff. I'm like, I'm not talking about, I have to like really, really mix things up so people don't, and I, I try to remove it from the situation, but it's not obvious that I'm talking about this situation at a prior company or something like that. Cause you, that'd be, that'd be uncool. <laughs> Of course. Now the, the Slack uh, that you have, it's, yeah. it's probably by far the most popular leadership technology Slack out there. I uh, think so. Yeah. I had sent you, and I don't know how you manage your invites, but I think I joined two years ago on your Slack because it was like an invite. I had like email or something. But, yep. yep. And I think it was actually from, I found it from reading one of your books now that I'm thinking about it. But what do you, what do you, what have you learned from running that community? Um, it's about, it's about, well, let's check right now. I think it's like 15,000. I don't know. Let's go look. Hold on. This is great radio. Oh, it's just under 14,000. Um, uh, let's see. What have I learned? Number one, um, you just mentioned this. Um, I, I, you, I, having friction, a little bit of friction to get in a community is a really, really good thing. You just mentioned you mailed me. To get in, you still have to mail me. And as you hopefully saw, I respond relatively quickly. Um, but it's it's uh, that, and I now have people like ask, say, hey, answer these questions or say some things there. Um, that keeps the floatsome and jetsome out. Um, the folks that just want to kind of come in and say, oh, this is cool. Blah, blah, blah. It takes a little bit of work and it takes a little bit of work for you and for me to get you in there. Um, so that means... I think I'm pre-qualifying humans in there a little bit higher. Um, number two is, uh, should be obvious, it's a leadership community. I'm not talking about video games or like, you know, baking or anything like that. So there's, there's a, I think, a higher bar from the, for the community to kind of treat each other as, it's like leadership slack. It's like, let's be leaders together. So I get some benefit of that sort of space that we're all existing in. Um, but that's still, the other thing I've learned is having a really, uh, clear, dynamic, and uh, 
code of conduct is actually really, really important. Um, even with uh, 14,000 leaders, we've had just things go sideways, it, misunderstandings, or just people that are whatever. Um, that exist I, I resisted it i'm like we're leaders we don't need a kind of code of conduct for like a year or so i'm like oh boy do we ever um <laughs> and you know, it's not it's not like a weekly thing but it happens frequently enough that we and i just go back to the code of conduct i look here and i say this is this behavior or this whatever it is um it, it's not the law it's just a it's a code of conduct but it's there to kind of give us guidance when things get a little strange and it it's incredibly helpful and i i we built that an admin community i think i got like six admins now and again it's not it's generally just takes care of itself it's generally every day there's nothing that admins have to do but having that there has been a really good backstop and it also it shows people that when something goes sideways we we are actively taking care of the community. And I think that gives people a sense of, hopefully a sense of safety in that, like that we're handling things. So it's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's one of my favorite things I've built. And, uh, and I've built a lot of things, um, mostly because I don't do a lot there. And it's just a lot of people self-serving and taking care of each other and answering questions and getting their resumes reviewed and, and getting jobs now. There's a lot of people that are like finding jobs there. So like, that's if you told me whenever it was many years ago and it started that that was going to be the case, I would have giggled. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. What inspired you to start it? I was, I was, I ran the blog post. The blog has been around for years and years. And I was, I surveyed folks and said, Hey, what are some other ways that we should be learning from each other? And the CEO of MailChimp, Mail, uh, who's a friend of mine, uh, acquaintance of mine, I was like, I was thinking, hey, I want to do a mailing list. He's like, you, you, what about, this is before I worked at Slack. He's like, what, you should just get a Slack going. I'm like, oh yeah, that makes a ton of sense. So I, I, um, this is before I worked there. I went and did a talk at Slack uh, for the engineering team about stuff that we're talking about right now. Um, and then when I was done, I'm like, hey, can I get a pro bono, like comp sort of Slack? And they're like, yeah, sure. No problem. They don't do this anymore. So I got this, I got this uh, comped one. And just, you know, opened it up and just it, it's flood. It's been a flood. It's just been constant growth. It's not crazy growth. It's not like millions of people, but it's 50 to it's 10 to 50 people a day or so, something like that ish, which is nice. That is nice. Yeah. And they're there to learn and then they contribute and yeah, all the beautiful things that come out of a community. Well, and it's also, it, it, the interesting thing to me is, there's channels where the same question has been asked a thousand times. Um, and everyone just keeps on answering. They're just taking, like, there's a lot of popular channels there and people come in there with the same question and people are saying the same thing. I always thought there'd be like a wiki or something created with sort of like the repeated knowledge. No, nope, people are just fine with like in the vet my resume channel answering the same questions over and over again. So it got to, it's got the real time sort of personal feel as well. You're not ever like, you're always talking with another human, which I love. Yeah, there's something different about that. Like, there's some, like, especially I notice it, this principle or this feeling when like pre sales sometimes w with a product. Mm -hmm. Like, I could go into the whole FAQ, but the chat and there's a human right there and they're going to give me so much more back than just going and reading one of the static FAQ yeah, posts. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's one of the things it's, it's there and it's these channels. Some of these channels have thousands and thousands of people. So, you get a lot of diverse perspective too, which is really cool. It's like on a day-to-day -day basis, I do nothing there. And, but on a day-to-day -day basis, the aggregate value being created is phenomenal. So how do you handle situations where I was talking about this with um, Reed, who's the CTO of like Travel Bank. Mm -hmm. And there, it, that was a really cool episode. He had background, is in the military. And so we got to talk about, you know, what, how he, learned leadership from the military and then applied those lessons. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we were discussing were, you know, how to handle situations where your teams get discouraged. And I was curious what your thoughts were on that. This, well, it's, it's a, this is one of those, it's, it depends question. It was discouraged how, um, I'll, I'll, I'll pull, I'll pull something from recent world when we're all now trapped in these boxes during a pandemic. Um, I, I, I'm twisting your question a little bit. Um, I am deeply worried about the lack of sort of the 
infrequent kind of low signal that we get just by hanging out together in the same physical space. Um, I can learn a lot from a staff meeting or from just bumping into you in the hallway about how you are doing. And that is so much harder in this new video conference world that we are living in and we'll be living in for a long time. Um, I, as an introvert, um, I'm generally okay because I can like hide in my cave and, 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 you know, people are work, but there's folks that are uh, extroverts right now that I think are really um, suffering because they get so much energy from being together and jamming together on stuff. Um, so trying to bring it back to your question, there's a despair in terms of us not being able to connect. So I have, we now have a daily standup with my staff at the end of the day. And it's just, there's no work. It's just us shooting the breeze and giggling about things. And it was super weird for the first couple of weeks. And now it's just part of what we do. Um, and it's us connecting and it's hopefully lifting us up a little bit and thing, making us feel connected when we are so terribly not connected. So that's a, slightly different version to what you're saying. Um, but that's the thing that I, when I thought about where am I worried about my team, that's an investment that I'm making right now in a time that we're deeply disconnected to feel connected and not get into despair in the first place, which is maybe the other answer to your question, um, which is don't let them get to despair, like head it off at the pass, learn about how things could go. And I mean, you don't get rewarded for you know, disasters that didn't happen, but that's actually your job is to make sure it doesn't get there in the first place. <laughs> that's a good answer. I, I like, I like that. <laughs> I was, I was reading your uh, Twitter and uh, I saw someone had tweeted at you and said, Hey, thank you for giving a name to those thoughts that <laughs> pop into your head while you're running. Can you describe that a little bit for me? I, I, I the title, the name of the thing is, a little confusing, but I love it. So we all know what flow is. Flow is, you know, you're sitting down at your computer and you're kind of, you got a very hard programming problem or engineering problem and you're, it takes a while to kind of get your brain kind of context switched into the complexity of the problem. And then, then you're just there and you're in this, just this flow state where it's just, you can just see it all. And it's as a code is just coming out. You're like, this is amazing. There's an, a, a term that I call anti-flow and it's probably better called like shower thoughts. I'm a biker. I bike a lot and I do some of the best work on my bike. And if I told you what I was going to work on when I go ride my bike later today, I would be lying because I have no idea. What happens is I just get on the bike and I'm kind of sitting there and I'm riding. It's, you know, 10, 20 miles or whatever it is. And things just pop in my head. And it's this wonderful gray matter that we have just kind of doing its pattern matching thing. But I, I, I'm literally this bike and going, oh, that's what I should do about Alice. I didn't, that's exactly the right solution. And it's letting go of the focus and all the things and all the stimulus and letting your brain just kind of wander through. And the story that I tell myself is that it's sort of this sort of interesting, it's kind of just knocking things together that are, you know, for, front of mind, Alice, the performance thing, the reorg, the book we're writing, whatever it is. And it kind of just kind of jams things together. And then it's those, sometimes the same spark and you're like, Oh, there's a great article there. Or, I, uh, oh, I know. I know what that talk, talks about, or I know what to say about that thing. It's a, uh, I love being on my bike because of that anti-flow. I, I had to develop a system to kind of keep track of all the things I'd think of because I'm on my bike, right? So I start to like remember the word. So at the end of a ride, I have this sort of sentence that makes no sense, which is bookmarks to everything that I thought of on the ride. And by the way, 50% of them, I never do anything, but the other 50% is like gold. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, that's what I'm, that's, that's anti-flow is what I call it. And it, I think it, it sounds negative and that's why people have some an issue with it, but it's not negative. It's just sort of the inversion of sort of the structured creative process. It's the unstructured creative process. Ooh, that was a good answer. <laughs> well, we're, we're recording it too. So we can play back. <laughs> no, I like that when I, when I was listening to the description, so I, I'm a runner, so I run and yeah, same and, thing. and yeah, you get the same thing. And so I've made a couple of rules. The first rule is I can't stop the run to write a note. <laughs> Yeah, same here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and the other time when I have those thoughts, um, I, when I was, I guess I interpreted it a little bit differently. So I interpreted it as the things I label distractions. Mm -hmm. So like I get new ideas all the time while I'm going through the process of achieving 
an existing idea. And so the only way for me to uh, complete the existing path I'm on is to label everything else that comes up a distraction and push yeah. it off to the side, put it into a bank uh, until a later until I complete my current goal. And so that's something that I've been learning a lot the past couple of years. Yeah, no, it's I, uh, I, I have one, two, three work notebooks, what two work, one fun here. And then I have a big notebook down here. These will all be filled over the next week or so with a whole process of capturing those distractions that you're talking about and putting them somewhere that I go look at them later enough that I, I honor them and I get them down. But, um, I need to focus on this thing that I'm doing right now. And, but I often go back and I'm like, Oh my God, that's amazing. It's, but it's, I, 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 as we've been talking about, I write everything down <laughs> and it, super useful because I later when I need it, it's, it's sometimes it's sitting there waiting for me. Yeah. Sometimes I'll use when I know I'll take the energy, I'll siphon the energy from that mm -hmm. burst of creative thought and idea that's brand new yeah. and so fresh and giving you those dopamine hits and all, all those things. And then I'll, I'll try to catch it as quickly as I can to then reallocate all of that energy and excitement <laughs> to complete something I'm already in the pro process of doing. That's super smart. It's a new, it's a new little hack. I like to look at our brains. It's like, I mean, more and more, especially after having kids, boy, are we like AI algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> we totally are. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm just trying to create a good environment, you know, yeah, for, the, totally. for, for not only for the kids, but for myself, I'm all, I'm, you know, curating my environment is a, I'm a big fan of recurring event reminders. So I have yeah. these like every two months or every three months I have these little things go off in my phone. It's like, make sure you're doing, you know, you're happy with the way you're spending your time. Uh, make sure you curate your environment to, to get the outcomes you're after. And then I, recently I got into uh, have you ever come across James clear with atomic habits. Yes. Have. Yeah. Yeah. So I bought one of the um, habit journals, nice. like a habit tracker slot. It's like a dot. So I normally have just notes, either grid or dot grid and then yeah. a pen. And that's how yeah. I structure my stuff. But this had, Basically, the first half of the empty notebook was uh, like dot grid stuff. And the second half was this, uh, you know, spreadsheet style, very beautiful looking uh, habit tracking system. And so nice. that's pretty useful. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's uh, I just need to I just need the paper and the pen, my favorite pen. And that's enough for me to kind of get it get it structured and also having habits in the morning. I do a, a morning sort of like what's going on here. Uh, what am I doing? What do I need to prep? Look at the notes. And in the, in the evening, I do a, a sort of a coalesce, of pull through everything, go through it, cross off on important stuff, rewrite stuff that needs to be captured. That that, that piece to me, the morning and the evening scrubs are, are key to kind of a, a, a healthy cadence around all the work that I'm doing. I like that. I do I do that with um, with my Evernote where I'll put like the six, six top things that have to get done. And then I revisit at the end of the day and move things off to the next day. But these little, these little processes that I've played with, I've probably tried a hundred things and then like oh, yeah. one or two I find effective and then it sticks with me throughout the years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like productivity systems. I've tried every single one for like a month and I've always gone back on a pen and a paper. It's just the thing that works for me. So I, I think things, and I mean, I do reminders in Slack too, but in general, my, the, the spine, the central nervous system of the LOP corporation are notebooks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I find that like putting time into stuff is important. My wife and I started like tracking our financials. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we found it wasn't about the tool, right? Like you can get meant and it kind of like does, it, it, and it wasn't about, anything other than us both sitting down on a Saturday and spending an hour just yeah. going through our goals. And, you know, it doesn't matter what type of spreadsheet. It's just that you're allocating thought processing time to it. Yep. Totally. Our version of that is my wife and I, every night we hang out, we have a hot tub here. Um, sounds weird, but with us to get, take a hot tub and it's, it's great, you know, kind of relax, but it's the most important part is sort of like the decompress from the day. Like what's going on? What are you doing here? Blah, blah, blah. Like, as marriage advice, like having 20 to 30 minutes every day where we're just kind of walking through sort of like what's going on. And sometimes it's just boring stuff. And some, but sometimes it's like, whoa, what are we going to do about the daughter or this sort of thing? So again, small things done well, bring it back to the book, it's a daily investment. <laughs> so I've been, I watched you and I, you had some interesting posts and 
and some good content and thoughts. And then I saw you go into retirement. Like you changed your label. It's like retirement. You had some fun like retirement thing. And I was like, that's pro cool. leisure circuit. Pro mm -hmm. leisure circuit. Yep, that's mm -hmm. what it was. And <laughs> I laughed a little bit at that. And then a couple, a, 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 an amount of time later, I saw the book come out. I was like, oh, that's what he's doing in retirement. But then when I noticed when I saw the book come out <laughs> that you had actually gone out, of, come out of retirement, I was like, what a cool move. Cause you can only come out of <laughs> retirement if you go into it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I I like working quite a bit. So it was uh, never in. It was it was pro leisure circuit was intended to be just some time off, and I was I thought I was going to take more, but um, Apple came a call in, and and I love Apple. So, ta da! Yes, I I'm I'm a huge fan of of their products, but I am curious. And yeah, yeah, yeah. What what was that like for you? Like, can you talk me a little bit through about like the mindset and the decisions going into retirement, and then the thoughts and everything coming? Can you just describe that period of time in your life? Yeah, totally. Um, the uh, uh, the last three gigs, which were Slack, uh, Pinterest, and before that, Palantir, and the role was very similar between all three, it was, it's different, but the same thing, it's same set of work was going on, which was we're about a hundred or so folk engineers and let's go make it 2000 um, or a thousand or 1500, whatever it is. Um, so it's rapid growth of an engineering team or company of culture of all sorts of hard things. And I did it three times in a row. So um, lots of opportunity to fail, lots of opportunity to learn, but ultimately a huge amount of stress. Um, in two of those cases, I was the VP of engineering. So the buck stopped with me, which means every day, everything that's getting on your plate is usually a pre-qualified disaster because your team's probably dealt, tried with it and blah, blah, blah. Like the things that are getting to you are usually the hardest problems, which is your job. Um, I'm exaggerating only a little bit. Um, so that doing that for eight and a half years was exhausting. So the pro leisure circuit, um, I never really thought about it as retirement because I, I mean, I did, but it wasn't, I called it that deliberately because I was just like, cool, I just, I need a break. Um, every day being a fire drill and every day the stakes being like, cool, are we, are we, <laughs> the stakes feeling incredibly high was just exhausting. Um, so it was, uh, it was nice to not have, you know, this constant sort of fire drill going on. Um, and it was good. I've, I've never really taken any time off. And this was about four months or so. And I was, I was kind of telling my wife I was going to like take a year or so because the last few companies have done well. Um, and so I'm, I'm blessed to be able to have that, that opportunity. But um, I, I, I really like working. <laughs> I, I really I enjoy it. Um, I've been working since I was 14. I got a job at a little local store. So I've been employed for a great many years. There's, it's not me. I don't know if it's a self worth thing or just a, a short attention span or like I like working or whatever it is. I really, really like, I really like building things. And um, so it was, I, you know, about two or months in, and there was an, an opportunity to come talk, come to talk to Apple and to do things there. And I really debated it that I didn't give myself enough downtime, but they were cool about starting a little bit later. So I had a good four months off. So it was nice. But I, I really enjoy that. I really, I like, there's no other simpler way to say it. It's like, I like working. I like working with people. I like understanding culture. I like having impact. I like going at places that people know about, whether that's an Apple or Pinterest or a Slack or Palantir, um, Netscape, Borland. There's just a long litany of things, companies that I've been at. And that's, so that was the thing. That was sort of the arc there was, it was time to relax. I relaxed, perhaps not enough. Maybe I should have done a little bit more. And they, then it was time to kind of, uh, get back to work, but in a very different context. Apple is not a startup. Um, it's a very, and I was there before. Um, so I was curious about all of these lessons that I'd learned on my journey around, um, around tech, what it would be like to go back to a place that I love and see what lop at this age, this level of experience, how I would do there. So, and that's a work in progress. Yeah. I like how you, I like how you, uh, refer to yourself like that you do it in a very it's a very it's very unique way and I enjoy it quite a bit because <laughs> I have an internal dialogue that um, often says oh Joel like this 
And that's because <laughs> in order to improve myself and to study myself, I've just had to constantly objectively consider myself. You know? Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, I talk about myself in the third person probably too much, though. So. <laughs> I think the perfect amount. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, this is good. I, I'm, I'm so excited that you, you're coming on and hanging out with us. You're the yeah, best, Yeah, absolutely. Man. Yeah, so, I appreciate it. So I'm curious, I'm curious on a couple of things here. So like, what do you think is, is something that, you know, in leadership that people aren't thinking about? Oh, okay. I, I, which, which, which chapter do I want to <laughs> recite here? I, um, I, I think we're generally paying a lot of, um, I think we're cognizant of inclusion and diversity as an important thing, but I don't think we're, doing enough at all. Um, I think we understand the problem set. We probably heard some important people tell us what to do, but when it comes down to making that hire um, as a leader who is responsible for making that hire, am I doing enough or not uh, doing enough in terms of talking to enough people, having a healthy pipeline um, and really investing in that. And I, it's, I got really lucky um, going to Slack because the founders there really decided from day one to make it a really diverse workforce. And you walked in and it was just obvious. Like you go around and like, I have never seen so much diversity in an engineering team. And that was because they chose from day one to make that and they developed a reputation. That's really, really hard to reverse engineer that into other companies if you're not even built it in from day one. So that's a thing that I think about a lot. And you were asking, what, but I think that's a thing that you have to, and it's not just about hiring. It's about being inclusive in a meeting, making sure the smallest voices have an opportunity to be heard. And it's super hard now that we're all stuck in these zoom calls. Um, but that's a, that's a thing that I, I think is it's, it's, it's weird because I know everyone cares about it and they're saying the right thing, but what are they actually doing on a day to day basis? Like what is the thing that they can point at and say, I did this differently because I want to build a more diverse team. So that's, that's the thing I think we need to be working on. Yeah. You know, I think I like the point you make about, they built it in from day one, they spent time and they cared about it. And because of that, they have a more nuanced understanding of what it is versus if you're just trying to implement it because it's the thing that needs to be right. implemented now, you sort of oversimplify um, because I, I take it far beyond, like I take diversity uh, beyond like gender and skin color to like, of thoughts, like, like yeah, of style course. of thinking, like different people think different ways. And so it's like, how does, how does your, your processor work? <laughs> you know, how do you compute data? And let's make sure we have a variety of people who compute data in different ways so that we can yeah. get a better result. No, it's, it's like ideas get better with eyeballs, man. And the more diverse the eyeballs, the better the idea, right? This is the competitive advantage that a diverse team has is you're, as you said, like I'm getting all of these different perspectives about my dumb idea and it's going to make it better. And if you like building software for humans, the the better your idea is, the more people that it can apply to, the more successful your business. So um, that's the thing about diversity. And I get, I get people get it, but that's the, and it's hard. By the way, what we're talking about is actually a fundamentally harder thing because in a more diverse team, you're going to have more discord. You're going to have more debate because you're going to have ideas which are totally different and challenging to whatever your sort of norms are. But even that, that ability to have a debate to kind of rationalize totally different perspectives. That's a muscle that you want in an engineer, any team, by the way, the fact that so-and-so can raise their hand and say, I totally disagree. And here's my perspective. And you're like, I don't get that at all, but explain it to me, right? Like these are, these are characteristics of a culture that you want to be in, right? And it's gonna be safer, but it, all the other important things, but also more productive, better ideas. Like, yes, check, 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 check. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> Yes, one hundred percent. Yeah, you're, you're so you're so good at. You, it's like I I would license you as my leadership AI. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I am. I this could be completely CG right now. You don't know, man. <laughs> I purchased some some time from the Lop Corp. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, but all right. So I've got a couple. Um, 
Oh, here's here's a good topic, and then it'll it'll introduce the next one, which is which is good because yeah, totally. is amazing. Uh, have you tried beyond your books and your career? Have you done monetization of the community at all, or with leadership content at all? No, um, I haven't, and um, no, it's it's crossed my mind, but I haven't done anything there, and. After after early on, I was like, I'm definitely not going to do it. And we got we got super aggro in our code of conduct about commercial activity in the Slack, just because number one, we were lucky that Slack comped it, so there's no bill for that. So thank you, Slack. Um, but also, the moment that you start to do that, it changes the vibe in the place. So we there's a couple channels like you know that are explicitly like looking for jobs and that sort of thing. But we're pretty aggro about shutting down other things because at that, I mean, just think about it, man. It's 14,000 liters. Um, uh, have maybe two or 3,000 of those a day are in there doing something. These are pre-qualified leaders. They're, how many people are interested in that demographic? The answer is a lot. Um, and we just, we really drawn a clear line about keeping it not not monetized at all. So. So yeah, I, I thought about it early on, but um, given the luckiness that I had in terms of getting this thing from Slack, it's just, it seems like a thing to, that we've sort of built a pretty strong wall around it. And it's getting harder because um, there's so many people there now. You know, there's folks that are sneaking in through the LOP email invite and like spamming folks saying, hey, by the way, there's this amazing site you should see. The good news is that the community is so used to it not being that way that they immediately go, whoa, this is a problem. And then an admin jumps in there and this cauterizes. So um, I think that's, I, 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 as long as Slack is paying the bill, um, then that's our, that's our current strategy. Yeah. Well, so like, I felt like that answer was a little bit more towards advertisers and Mike and yeah. where I was coming from is a little bit more towards like you making premium content. <laughs> oh, me? Oh. Yeah. Like you making content for the community. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, because your content's so good. And <laughs> here's the thing when you, and here's what I found too, cause I was super against like monetization of the podcast and everything until I, uh, found like a different way to frame it because yeah. by offering something that's premium, we then cash comes in and we can hire people to make content that's even better. And then that's useful yeah. to people. And I mean, it's definitely like an undertaking, but I was just curious if you had done that at all. I've, I've thought about it, but here's, here's my, my, my slippery response. Um, I, the amount of opportunity that has been given to me over the last 10 years because of my writing um, being available to anyone. I mean, you can buy the book. Um, that's one thing, but that's not a lot of money at all. Um, the amount of opportunity, which has actually turned into monetization in terms of being at companies that have been reasonably successful is is amazing. And I'm the value that I'm getting from my writing right now. I, yeah, I, yeah, there would be a way to create more dollars. Sure. But I, by having it as broadly available to everyone, I think I'm already getting max value. <laughs> Maybe I'll change my tune in a world where I'm not working. And cause I also feel like, um, I, the, the act of working is always giving me good content. So I feel like it's partly giving back when I'm like, Oh, this is a weird political situation. Oh my God, there's an article here. That getting that back is part of part of my <laughs> therapy is also but also kind of sharing what's going on with as many people as possible so i've never i've been i've been really lucky in that i've had good jobs and i've never really wanted to create it and i don't i don't really have a desire to kind of operationalize it in terms of getting other people in i mean i had an editor and you know that sort of thing i don't see a scale thing that i want to actually go do, but maybe, you know, in a, in a post Apple world, I build up the Rand's leadership consulting group. There is a, there's something to do there, but right now it, it feels, it feels very balanced to me. Nice. And that's the important thing, right? You go with what you feel is right. That's the beautiful part about setting, setting up your life. Right. And the discipline gives you freedom. And okay. So now I've got a thing that popped into my head that, uh, I would like your insight on. So yeah. Going into this, I'm going into a second book, and what I have so far is we're calling it Tech Titans, mm -hmm. and uh, we've got basically the best advice like extracted from like 400 interviews, 
but they're like, you know, two minute, like two paragraph, if you translate them into text, like insight. And so then we have them organized by topic. So you go to culture and you get sure, all these sure. different CTOs. And what I was struggling with was how to put the book together, like structurally, because one, I'll just tell you like uh, one or two of the ideas, and then that'll give you a better understanding. Yeah. So the first idea was like, let's take a chapter culture would be for me to write some sort of like consolidated experience slash a story included. And then, inc and then after that, maybe that's like a page or two at the beginning of the chapter culture. Mm -hmm. And after that, you get four or five, six pages of, you know, here's a CTO of NASA, Microsoft, Verizon, you know, saying their thing on right, culture. Right, right, right. Um, the other way was to put all of my thoughts up front, like my, and then just have like split the book in half, like a radical candor did where she put like, uh, did you read that book, Radical Candor? I did. Yeah. Kim, uh, like the front was like all her narrative, and in the back half was uh, like a bunch of actionable uh, frameworks. Um, hmm. I, I I would go with the following rule: attention spans are short. So I would I would say um, I would go with. I don't know. Here's another version. I uh, didn't say this one which is, so you've got, you've got, you already have the chunks, you know what the chunks are. Okay. Maybe, maybe it's let the, let the, let the experts teach first. So lead with your things. So you, you have the title culture or something, then you have your N chat stories or distilled wisdom and then finish with what you learned from that. I kind of like that because your conceit here is you're, you want to capture the wisdom of all these leaders and your, your insight and what you learn from it is interesting. But I feel like if you lead with your, your thoughts from that, it's sort of, it's not what your intent of your book is. Right. Does that make sense? Like it's that actually is like, way better. That's why I'm so glad I asked you this question. That is the <laughs> best way. And it follows it, it. Yes, that is good. And then there's just the fear of like, you know, I, I, it's all, like your book managing humans. When you uh -huh. were when you were doing this, yeah, it feels like it's not only it's a reference book, but it's also you could just read right through it. How did you intend it? Well, well, number one, this is the third edition you have in your hands, so it's gotten better each time. So editing, um, back to our first topic, um, I, I it was 50, 60 percent of it was existing stuff that I kind of shaped into a narrative. But the other thing is the last two editions, and there's a fourth edition coming out in January, by the way. Um, I've been able to have been lucky enough to be able to kind of shape it, move it around and kind of make it an arc. But it was you, the answer, direct answer to your question. It's intended to be um, you can just go in and say, oh, cool, I want to read about feedback. It was intended to be standalone chapters because it was really inspired by the blog. But it's a, uh, it, I'm glad you said that, that it can be a narrative there. It is, it, I do try to kind of make it sort of like a progression. Um, it's something I really tried to do in the third book as well is really have it be sort of like um, uh, more of a book, even though it's still, the third book is still, you can just read a chapter and it's kind of like a blog post, but there's a little more connective tissue there. But the answer to your question is, it was intended to be just go grab a chapter and, and read it and it can stand alone by itself. And did you do an audible for managing humans? I think so. I keep on getting asked this question in the publishers. I think there's a, I think it's out there. Um, I'll double check. I don't know right now. I always, someone told me I should do the, for the third book, I should be the person who's reading it, which I like that idea, but uh, that sounds like a lot of work and like finishing a book is writing a book is, as you know, is a ton of work. Um, and when you're done with it, you don't want to see it for about a year or so. You're like, I just, oh, I, I know. <laughs> I'm like, I never want to see this. It's awful. It's a horrible book. I never want to see it again. And then you're like, oh, no, it's actually pretty good. But I'm about six months into that sort of detox of it. I don't even want to think about the book. <laughs> yeah. It's like for me with like writing software, I come back to the book and I'm like, this could be so much better. <laughs> yeah. This is, um. so this is, uh, this is the uh, fourth edition um, notes. Oh, there's a fourth yeah, coming. Yeah, but this is the actual third edition. But this is the fun part. What I'm doing right now is I'm just rereading it with a pen and I can go and be like, oh, that's garbage or nuke this chapter. Well, I'll say this thing here. So it's this really awesome opportunity to take something which, I, which people generally like and kind of like, cool, I can even make this better. And also more relevant. I think I'm gonna, actually, I know I'm gonna write some work from home chapters for it and get a little bit more into this world of us being trapped in this 
in these boxes behind these screens. Yes. And you had a great post and we'll link to it in the show notes uh, on tips for your audio video quality and work from (laughs) home blog post. That was really good one too. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, It was fun to write. That was one of those like, Oh, I got to write this post and it just happened. It was done. Great. (laughs) Amazing. Beautiful. I knew today was going to be an amazing conversation. Michael, you are the man. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Great questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. Absolutely, sir. You have a great day, okay? And be safe. You too. Bye.